Good afternoon and um, welcome to uh, this uh, contact webinar on fundraising. Um, I'm Jane Burns and I'm the Director of Fundraising and Marketing at Contact. I've been with Contact now for four years, but been a fundraiser for something like 32, I think. Um, so hopefully I'll have something useful to share with you. Um, and uh, we're going to get through a lot of stuff today. Um, we could take an hour for every section of this. So um, I will try and cover as much as I can in the time available. Um, if I could get the slides to scroll, that would be. Ah, oh, there we go. So um, if there's a technical hitch, I've just had one of those. Um, do bear with us. Um, hopefully you'll be familiar with this as a, a medium of, uh, of exchanging this kind of information. Um, you are asked to remain muted. Uh, I've left uh, lots of space in the presentation for questions. Um, so do send those questions through as we go through and I'll pick them up at the gaps. If there's anything I see that's really relevant to the particular thing I'm talking about, um, then I'll, I'll perhaps deal with that as we go. No question is stupid. Um, and I can guarantee if there's something you think, oh, I'm sure I should know that, that you won't be the only one thinking, I'm sure I should know that. Um, so please do send the questions through. Um, anything that we can't deal with today, in terms of questions, we will put onto the website uh, and you'll get information about that. And don't forget the questionnaire at the end, which is essential to making sure these are fit for purpose going forward as well. So fundraising, what are we going to cover today? Well, we're going to talk firstly about preparing a case for support. And um, this is a really important element of your fundraising because actually it's the basis on which you do all of the fundraising. Uh, so it's worth spending a bit of time on that. So we'll go through what, what that involves. We're going to take a whistle stop tour around trusts, foundations and statutory fundraising. And I'm going to try and give you some pointers on what's involved and how to approach that and where information can be found. Uh, we're going to go through community and events fundraising, which I suspect might be the one that you're all um, oh, Excuse me, I think that's my phone, which I'm sure you're hearing. Um, that's another technical hitch. Um, so, yeah, so we're going to go through um, community and events fundraising, which is the one you've probably got most experience of, even if that's as a participant rather than actually organising it. And we're going to touch on corporate fundraising, then a brief bit on keeping it legal. Um, and finally, I'm going to share a couple of examples of stuff that other forums have done, uh, which um, hopefully will give you some some kind of sense of what's possible and um, some encouragement to actually to do some fundraising. OK. Developing a case for support. So a case for support as the National Council for Voluntary Organisations tells us, sets out why donors should give to a charity or as in our case a forum and how the donor can contribute to its activities. And as I've already mentioned, this will underpin all of your fundraising. <clears throat> so what's critical with your case for support is that it talks to the heart and to the head. So it's important that you have the logical stuff, the stuff, the facts and the figures in there, that you've got some rational explanation, all of that stuff. But it's also to share, also important to share emotion and um, feelings and real experiences so that people can feel it as well as understand it. And if you can crack that, then that will be when you get the most effective, um, the most effective case for support. This, this slide is a summary of, of what makes a good case for support, the, the, the components that are included in that. So we start at the top at 12 o'clock with the challenge. Um, what's the need? What's the problem that we're trying to solve here? Um, we move on to uh, what the response to the problem is, how lives will be changed, what the impact, so what the response is and what the impact to that response is <clears throat> the benefits to the supporter. This isn't a huge bit of it, but it's important to tell your supporter why their support matters. 
And then finally, uh, a bit about the charity or the forum in your case. Some of you are charities, I know some of you aren't. What your mission is, what you've achieved, what your history is and track record. And we'll come to why that's important in a little while. So the challenge or problem. So what we're looking here for, for here rather, is what the need is. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Now that might be um, a big need. So it might be we're trying to solve homelessness. Uh, it could be a smaller need that we're trying to solve homelessness in a very small town or city. From the point of view of the kind of work we're all involved in, um, it could be that we're just presenting the overall work of the organisation. So what we do as a forum, um, it might be that we just want to try and get some funding for a particular piece of work. So an event for families. So it can be big and it can be small. But what we need to have is the evidence for that need. So what is what is telling us there is a need and evidence could be a survey. It could be anecdotal because people have told us. Um, there is also you can use uh, evidence that's bigger than that. So we know nationally that um, there are statistics available for certain things. Contact us surveys. We did one on counting the costs recently. So one of the stats that came out of that was 24 percent of families with disabled children uh, go without food. Um, so that could be evidence for bid even at a, 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 or, or fundraising, even at a local level. Um, you have to tell people why it matters. So, you know, the fact that people are going without, what are the, what, why does that matter? Why is that important? And that's where you can use a case study because there's nothing more descriptive about why it matters than somebody telling you exactly why it matters. And the final element of the challenge or problem is why this problem needs solving now. Um, why is there an urgency? Why can't it wait? Till next week and a very simple example of that is if somebody's starving if you don't feed them now then they'll die but it's a little bit more nuanced for the kind of work that we're involved in um, so that's the challenge of the problem and then what do we do in terms of um, the response so the response to that need is what it is that you the forum do to change that situation to resolve that problem to meet that need so what is it you're going to do and what difference will that make um, again there's nothing more powerful than a case study or a quote um, and so for example uh, you know if if we if you it might be that you get funding that gives parents the ability to get back to work to have a better quality of life you know there are all sorts of um of, of reasons there are all sorts of things that that would describe the difference it can make and I'm going to give you some examples in a little while now what I would say here is when you're looking at this remember to ask the so what question which is really important so uh, the difference it makes so if somebody said um, uh, if you've got if you're asking for financial support for something so the if the difference it makes is that um, parents have more money so what well if they have more money then they can they can buy food for their children so what and you're actually trying to get right down to exactly why this is important so if you can keep asking a so what question about it you haven't got to the very nub of of the um the importance of that response and i hope that's clear if it's not clear we can come back to that so uh, the other thing to include as well, I have mentioned this, the benefits to the supporter. Um, here's a simple way. This is just a phrase out of a, a, a grant application to a trust. So a grant from whoever will mean that families of disabled children in hospitals around the UK can get support at a moment of crisis that will have long lasting benefits for the whole family. Now, um, it's as simple as that, actually. Uh, and that makes people feel good. We, you know, if you're giving money yourself, if you think about what the benefits are to you, often it's simply that you feel better for having done something. And the final element of your case for support is going to be um, information about the forum, what you're about, what your mission is, what you're there for. 
what you've achieved, a bit about your history, and include in that why you are best placed to do this. So why are you the organisation that can deliver this work? And that will be around the knowledge and experience you have, the fact that you have good relationships and close um, contact with parents, um, the fact that you do co-production can be one of the reasons why you're best placed to do this. Um, you're trying to create a sense of being a really credible organisation and having a track record in something really helps. So to be able to say we've done this before and this was the outcome can really uh, support that, that case for support. So all of that needs to go in. When you draft the case for support, you can put them in the order as I've described them here, but they don't have to be. And sometimes you might put five uh, somewhere near the beginning because actually you might feel you need to answer that question sooner. And I'm going to share a case for support with you, um, which uh, you'll be able to access all of it after the webinar um, when it all goes up on the website, where you'll see that we put that bit, number five, a bit earlier on in the actual. Um, funding application so you can you can play about with where where they best fit so that's the case for support then now here I'm going to give you an example um, of one of the ones that that uh, that we we've got at contact <coughs> just bear with me I'm just operating too many devices there we go um, so this is about our By Your Side Hospitals project and the challenge or the need is every day in the UK over 100 children are born or diagnosed with a disability. This is something that no parent prepares for with the same hopes and dreams as others to see their children grow up to reach their full potential and live a happy life. Such a diagnosis can be overwhelming. On top of the common feelings of fear, guilt, confusion, anger and anxiety, there are a multitude of practical issues to tackle. Many families simply don't know where to turn for help in a world they didn't know existed. Without support and effective intervention, families can face years of isolation and disadvantage. They risk spiralling into crisis. Three quarters of parents with a disabled child experience mental health, such as anxiety, depression or breakdown. Uh, one in five parents with a disabled child say that isolation has led to the breakup of their family. And that sentence that starts with out support and effective intervention, that tells you why it's urgent. This is why, why we have to do this now. So we go on to say, moreover, families face the financial double burden of reduced income of working less, if at all, to care for their child, whilst also managing with the extra costs of disability. It can cost twice as much to bring up a disabled child than a non-disabled child. And what you might do with that challenge, if you're putting that in a bid, is you might actually, well, you would tell them where you got that evidence from. And that's from research um, that Contact has done. Um, and we've done research. Other organisations like Scope also do that kind of research. So there's quite a bit of that out there. So that's the challenge for our By Your Side Hospitals project. So what's our response? Well, our response is reaching families in hospital. And that's why reaching families in hospitals is so important. Families are at their most vulnerable at the point of diagnosis or when their child is hospitalised. During moments like these, families are under intense stress. Getting the right support at the right time can make a world of difference, from guiding parents through the next steps of their child's journey to keeping families together and financially stable. By Your Sight has been designed to enable families to face the future with confidence and prevent future hardships. So there's a reason about that. There's our response and why that's important. And then what we would do is go on to give them a bit more information about By Your Side. So, as I say, the whole of that case of support will be available to you um, so you can see how we've pulled that together. Um, but here's a couple of more simpler ones, really, which um, from other from other organisations. So here we've got uh, Click Sergeant um, who uh, support children and young people with cancer. So the challenge as if a cancer diagnosis isn't tough enough, the final impact of cancer can be devastating. Our research shows parents spend an average of £600 more every month when their child has cancer. Lots of travel for treatment, hotels, extra heating costs at home. It soon adds up, causing further anxiety and worry. 
So that's the challenge, and that's really neatly put. This has come off their website, which is why it's so succinct. The response is that Click Sergeant care teams work with young people and families to help them get vital financial support. We arrange Click Sergeant grants and help them to get the benefits and other support they're entitled to. We also help liaise with young people's employers and sort out housing issues to keep families together because day to day life doesn't stop when you have cancer. So that's really neat in a nugget. I mean, it's often easier when you've got a really simple cause to explain. And if you look at charity websites, you'll see examples of this. Sometimes you won't see any, interestingly. Um, but there's a simple challenge and response. OK. So example two, thousands of children and young people are being sexually exploited in every type of community across the country, forced to do, see and hear things they never should. We want to stop this exploitation right now. Children as young as 10 are being targeted. Their childhoods are being ripped away by adults who prey on them. They win their trust and abuse them through sexual exploitation. So the response, uh, we support children and young people intensively to cope with the trauma of sexual exploitation. We spot the warning signs and help make exploitation stop. We help them through the intimidating complex justice system so that they are listened to and can try to get justice for the crimes against them. Uh, again, really simple. So um, if you want something to, to to pass the time with, it's worth having a trawl around and seeing uh, what it is that people are doing to describe their work. I've given you simple ones. There are, are more complex ones. Um, and uh, it's sometimes really fascinating to see how charities who find it more difficult to explain their cause um, try to do that. So uh, you could do that if you've got some spare time. So that's that's broadly the case for support. That was fairly quick. Um, and we have now got time for questions, if you've got any. Um, we have one, which is quite a long one from Carol. Um, the question she has given me is sustainability for parent care reform. The issue we have is that co-production work is seen as an indirect benefit to children and therefore funders find it's difficult to understand and are reluctant to fund. Thinking about your example by your side, we're not offering support and advice, a tangible thing, but working with local providers to improve that advice and support is not as tangible. So basically what you do is more difficult to describe. And I think um, that's true. What I would say about co-production is that um, there are funders and the uh, Na National Lottery Community Fund, which used to be the big lottery fund, is one of the funders who are really passionate about co-production. Um, and uh, <laughs> what you have to do, I think, is think a bit more creatively about how you describe the work that you do. So, and you're talking about an indirect benefit to children, but actually, is it about children or is it about families and parents? So one of the uh, one of the benefits of the work that you do, for example, is it makes um, parents more employable. So if you've got somebody who's been caring for their child and they can volunteer uh, or get involved with the Parent Carer Forum, um, then actually they develop skills which can get them back into work. So that's an example of something that you might do that is of benefit. Um, and I think you've just got to think about it a little bit uh, creatively. Um, children are generally much easier audience to raise money for, but, but there are other issues, and particularly in the moment, issues around mental health and well-being, where you could get funding that is seen, whatever the work you do, that is seen to benefit people's mental health. Um, can be can be a different angle so yes it's more difficult um but there should be ways of framing the work that you do where there is a real tangible benefit um and i'm hoping that's made sense uh we have okay question yeah um and carol's come back and said that one and two are about direct support for children and not relevant to parent care forum engagement that's absolutely right um I'm not giving them to you necessarily because they are translatable in terms of the work that you do, but because it just to give you an idea of how to structure it. Uh, you could go to somebody like if you look at the case for support for an organisation like Mind, for example, or um, 
perhaps a charity that deals with a challenging um, uh, medical condition, maybe um, HIV and AIDS. Um, young minds would be potentially an example uh, where they're perhaps dealing with issues around mental health. Uh, charities like Gingerbread who are working with single people where you've got less sexy causes. Um, those people will be doing this well. Um, but it is possible to make a case around the work that you do, I think. Uh, well, not, I don't think. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. OK. Um, one of the things that I haven't covered in this uh, uh, um, webinar is how you actually tackle developing a case for support. Um, I mean, if that was something that people thought might be useful, then then we could probably pull something together that you could um, that you could share. What I would say is that it's always helpful to do it together rather than just one person. And sometimes it can can help to start with knowing what the funder supports to work out how you might craft what you've got to submit to them um, to meet their objectives. So we can we could do a bit more for you on that if that's helpful. So I think that looks like all the questions. If you think of something on the section we've just done as we carry on, don't worry, put them through. We'll pick it up later. Um, you haven't missed your opportunity. OK, so trust foundations and statutory sources. This is a big source of funding for the voluntary sector. Um, there are 8,800 trusts and foundations in the UK. Um, and I mentioned the National Lottery Community Fund here because it behaves like a trust. It's quite difficult to know what to call it. Um, some people would argue it's statutory funding. Others would say it's effectively a foundation. Um, but but they are whatever they describe as are a, a big funder of the voluntary sector, a big funder of the voluntary sector. Um, uh, they um, you will find uh, Trusts um, are local. They can fund. You'll get trusts who will just fund in a very small geographical area. They might be national, um, where they fund um, uh, uh, anywhere in the country. Uh, they can be really large. There's some massive ones, and they can be tiny, where they might give away a few thousand pounds a year. Uh, so they come in all shapes and sizes. Some will be family trusts set up uh, when somebody. Either a family has a lot of money they want to give away or somebody dies and they turn their estate into a trust. Some of them might be run by companies. Uh, Lloyd's Foundation is an example of that. And what they all do is they give funding to activities that match their funding objectives, which are limited by their charitable objectives. So they are set up as charities and they will have a set of objectives. And what they will do is Sometimes they'll have a set of funding objectives that never change. Some of the bigger ones will change their funding objectives um, slightly from year to year. Uh, I've already mentioned that one of the, the big hot topics at the moment is starting to be um, uh, mental health. Um, so you, we're finding some of the bigger trusts are opting to include that going forward as, a, a, as one of the criteria. The other thing to know about them is that they vary in terms of how professional they are and how often they distribute funding. So some will um, have a schedule. They meet three times a year and they consider applications at that point. Some will be much more ad hoc. Um, some won't um, won't tell you when they decide um, and some won't tell you when they're going to fund you, whether or not they're going to fund you. The first you will know is you get a check. And if they're not funding you, you never hear from them, uh, which can be a bit dispiriting, actually. But but they do vary in terms of how professional. And I think that reflects um, uh, uh, that reflects uh, the, the, the fact that some of them are just run by a volunteer. Um, so they <coughs> sorry, next slide. Um, Trust will vary as to whether you have to be a registered charity or not. And what I would say as well is some of the bigger ones are a bit more understanding of the more difficult causes. So they would uh, be willing to take a little bit more time to understand what it is you're trying to offer. Some of the smaller ones would also require less convincing, although that's not a rule of thumb necessarily, but, but they do vary. Um, they vary whether you um, have to be a registered charity or not. Some just want you to be a voluntary organisation. and um, they offer two types of funding usually. So they will offer project funding, 
um, and capital funding. Some do both, some do one or the other. Now, when we, we talk about project funding, that would be so the um, by your side project I mentioned that, that contact do, that's a project. Uh, if we were trying to build um, uh, a centre for families, uh, a community facility for families, that would require capital funding. Capital tends to be for stuff and project tends to be for pieces of work that you're delivering. Trusts also prefer restricted to unrestricted uh, requests. So unrestricted is where you would say, we're a forum, we're doing this amazing work, will you give us some money to continue it? And these are the sorts of things we do. And they're not telling you, you're not telling them what you want to spend it on specifically, just your work. Restricted would be where you say, we're a forum and we're organising a training day for parents um, and we want you to fund it. That would be very restricted to that particular piece of work. And the restricted stuff is the stuff that tends to be more easy to fund. Um, talking about statutory funding, that's local, national um, government, uh, NHS trusts. And you get quite a bit more information on that on um, Funding Central. Um, the NCVA also has some information on statutory funding uh, and hopefully you will be aware of what's going on in your own local authority in terms of availability of funding. And do remember the lotteries. So uh, people's postcode lottery um, would be an example. Uh, there are other lotteries out there as well as the big national one. Uh, it's worth keeping an eye out as to whether there's anything locally. I do know, I think there's Essex actually has a kind of um, more local, uh, more local lottery. So when I talked about um, trusts having uh, objectives, I've just randomly picked one here that's got quite a diverse set of objectives. It's called the Headley Trust. It's part of the Sainsbury family of trusts. And this is a summary of what they do. And they obviously like churches and cathedrals, um, arts and heritage. But if you see at the very bottom of that list, they'll fund health and social welfare. Um, and then if we go a little bit further into it, you will see that uh, this is their criteria for um, health and social welfare, the sort of work that they will fund. So the first three, there's obviously a real passion for them for um, older people and um, but they do young people and disadvantaged um, families and they also provide practical aid grants for practical aids so quite diverse and obviously potentially the work that you do would fit into the support for disadvantaged families and young people so that's just to give you an example of what that looks like I did say I would give you a little bit more information on National Lottery Community Fund. It used to be called the Big Lottery Fund. Um, it's had a little bit of a rebrand. Uh, and one of the things that uh, the National Lottery Community Fund do is a, a, a funding stream called Awards for All. And this is uh, funding from £300 to £10,000. And this is about supporting what matters to people and communities. And they've got three areas that they will, will fund. So that's shaping the places and spaces that matter to communities, um, bringing people together and build strong relationships in and across communities. Now, that's something that would apply to forums, uh, enable more people to fulfil their potential by working to address issues at the earliest stage. So, again, actually, that's um, that really does apply to the work that 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 you do, I think. Um, it's a really straightforward application process. Uh, so it, worth a look if you think you might have something that they will fund. The lottery also does bigger funding streams. Um, and if you are in the, in the right place where that's appropriate for you, that's worth looking at. But this is uh, quite a nice little funding stream that they have. Um, and very easy to find on their website. They're also a, a supportive funder. Uh, they they like a dialogue with you. Um, they are, you know, their business is about helping the voluntary sector organisations they support to uh, do the best and be the best they can be. And this awards for all, you can apply for this whether you're a registered charity or not. Um, so I'd have a look at that if I was you. Okay, um, 
One of the parent care reforms in Telford, and well, the parent care forum in Telford and Reeking have um, had some um, lottery funding. Now, I have to admit to not knowing exactly what it is they've had funding for, but they have shared some advice um, on working with the National Lottery um, Community Fund. And I would say this is actually really good advice when working with any potential funder. Um, and, and it's simple. So keep to the principles of your governance document. Don't chase funding. It's really easy to get funding driven rather than driven by what it is you want to do. Um, look to work with local partners. Lottery loves that. In fact, lots of funders like you to be working it with, with local partners, particularly if you are avoiding duplication. Um, and building up a good relationship. That's more difficult sometimes with trusts and foundations, but it's not difficult with big lottery, with the National Lottery Community Fund. Um, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, and they're used to dealing with organisations with all types and levels of expertise. Um, so, you know, they get that you might not understand things. Um, and they do provide lots of information and guidance. Um, and Pod's advice on that is use it all. The other thing that's really important is the evidence. I'll touch on that a bit uh, probably later as well. But, you know, do record everything. Be really clear about um, what your uh, the evidence is for the work that you do um, and how that links into local priorities. So, you know, what's going on locally and nationally that links to what you're actually trying to provide. Self-evaluation is a tool that they produce that helps you to do that, which is powerful. And it says involve the whole of your organisation and set up a working party if you want to, but don't forget to involve everyone. There's nothing worse than an organisation with a rogue fundraiser. Um, so, you know, you need to get people to buy into what you're doing and be passionate about what you're um, applying for monies for and what you want to achieve. Because um, if you're passionate, if you're not passionate, you'll never get them to be. And uh, consider staffing in the bid. Um, Obviously, that's paid and unpaid staff. Um, have you got enough to be able to do all you need to do in terms of project management evaluation? And look after yourself. It's a tough job. And it is a tough job because actually one of the things that makes it tough when you apply for money, sometimes people say no. And that can be really difficult, particularly if you're if you're passionate about about the cause. OK, so that's our advice from POS. So in terms of how to apply, for funding um, we'll do it how they tell you to so when you go onto the website of a trust or foundation they will give you some guidance usually or often on how to apply um, many of them will have an application form more and more are doing it online uh, but some don't um, do that and I'll, I, I'll touch on what to do about that if that happens um, and also bear in mind that some don't ex uh, don't take um, uh, unsolicited applications so in other words unless they invite you to apply uh, you can't so don't just make sure that you're not applying to one like that because actually you'll just waste your time putting the application together and remember as well that they are likely to expect a copy of your report and accounts um, and they don't expect that to be massively sophisticated but they will but they will want to know that you are financially a credible organisation if they're going to be giving you their money. I've said they often have an application form. If not, so what do you do? Um, that's what that lovely gorilla's thinking about. So this is just uh, how to structure an application. So you start off with a summary, a concise explanation of what you're proposing. Um, always a good idea. And then you give a bit of introduction and background. And it's here that you would use from your case for support stuff around um, mission, um, aims, what you're about, how you're structured, what your track record is. So this is an example of where that in your case for support would come a bit higher up than number five. Um, then you talk about the problem, what it is, how it's arisen, why and where it's occurring and who's affected by it. The where can be important. If you're if you're applying to somebody for funding who has a criteria about the, the locality, the, the region or the place in which they'll um, fund stuff, then you need to make sure you mention that that's where you're working um, and you need to talk about who's affected by it. And if you've got stats and things, that's always really helpful. 
Um, you then talk about the solution. So what it is you're going to do. So what, what's the project you want them to fund, basically? Uh, what you expect the outcomes of that to be and the impacts that it will have and what you're going to measure. Um, and that can be really simple. Sometimes that can be we're doing this uh, training event for families uh, or for parents. Uh, we expect 25 parents to attend. Uh, you would perhaps do a little questionnaire for them to see how they felt before it and after it. Um, so you could you could feed all of that into into your application. And also you need to know how, how you're going to know it's been successful. And if you think with this, if you think about how do I know if it's been successful, you need to link that back to um, what the problem was. So you'll know it's successful if you solve the problem. How do you measure that? Uh, and the kind of business we're in, that can be more difficult. Um, at Contact, we struggle with that sometimes, knowing exactly how we, we're going to measure things, because it's often it's about how people feel. Uh, and how, you know, if, if you if you're doing a, a, a course that's designed to give people a particular um, some information and advice, uh, some training that provides them some training or something that would benefit them in helping to care for their child, for example, um, you can't. It's much. It's quite difficult to measure that they're actually able to do that better. It will be about how they feel about it, and sometimes the outcomes aren't around what they now can do. It's about the fact that they feel better, that they're more optimistic, more confident, feel more in control, you know, because that creates better mental health and actually better family life and supports relationships and all that kind of stuff. So to think about that a little bit, bit creatively. Um, budget, you need to put a budget in. So if you're asking somebody for money, they're going to want to know how you spend it. Um, Again, it doesn't have to be very complicated. It depends on what you're asking them to fund. You could simply be saying, we want £500 to run this um, training event and uh, £300 is for the room hire and £200 is for materials and refreshments. Um, if you're asking them for £25,000, you probably need a more detailed budget. And the final thing you probably want to cover with them about whether this is future funding uh, is about future funding. So is this a one off? If you just want to run this family event or family day or whatever activity it might be, it's a one off, self-contained. It will make a difference. That's great. But if you're saying we are starting this work and it's going to last three years and we've got all these amazing objectives for it. And you're asking for five thousand pounds out of ten, they'll want to know where the other ten is coming from. Um, they want to know that it is sustainable. So you just need to bear that in mind as well if you're going for, for bigger chunks of money. OK. So once your funding is secure, what's, what do you do? Well, I've put in bold here that, that you, um, you thank them. Uh, sounds really simple, doesn't it? If somebody gives you money, of course you thank them. But you'd be surprised how many people forget to do that. And that's certainly feedback from trusts would be that that happens more often than you might believe. Um, also report on how the money has been spent. Now, some will tell you they want a report. But even if they don't, if you get some funding for an event, you thank them for the funding, you run the event, you write to them and tell them how fabulous the event was, has been. And here's a couple of quotes from, from parents who, who, were, who were at the event and the difference it's made. The other thing is, is always to do what you said you would. Don't make the cardinal sin of getting £500 to fund X and then you decide to spend it on Y because actually they can ask you for the money back if you do something like that. And it does nothing for the relationship. And do develop the relationship. So what do you have that they might be interested in? Go the extra mile. You know, if they're a trust that's got a particular interest in some area of work or activity, um, you might come across a piece of research that you think they might be fascinated by. Send it to them. You know, you can actually just develop that relationship. Sometimes you might invite them to something you're doing. Um, they probably won't come, but they will remember that they got the invitation. So. It's not all, um, it doesn't all stop when the check lands. 
Okay. Now here is um, there are some useful links to funders. Um, so places where you can find information uh, uh, on specific funders. Uh, so for example, the Association of Charitable Foundations, Charities Aid Foundation, there's Community Foundations Network. They fund. They are usually um, county wide. Um, and worth having a look to see what it is they're doing and what they're funding. Lots of information on government funding. Um, so have a look at that. Lottery funding about what lottery funding. This isn't the national lottery. This is about general lottery funding. And then a, a, a lovely website called Funder Finder, um, which again, worth a look at. And I've put the address in the link in there for the National Lottery Community Fund as well. Um, to be honest, any of these, if you Google it, you'll find it. it they're not they're not hidden. OK. Um, there, you can get um, very expensive books um, that list all charitable trusts and um, foundations. There are a lot of money there. Are, often much easier and cheaper to go through these kind of websites, even if occasionally you might need to pay some kind of subscription. You will also have local organisations who might, and I'll come on to that a bit later, who might um, be able to provide information on stuff that's available locally. Okay, so, so next lot of questions. Um, just picking up from a question uh, from the section on case for support and Carol's made the point that it would have been uh, helpful to see examples of the type um, uh, the type of case of support that is supporting the work that you do I get that um, if I was doing this again I'd see what I could find I understand how you struggle to define and make a case around the work that you do um, I've had some conversations with the national network as well because we've had been talking about a case for support. What you do is actually well pretty unique, I guess. Um, and I know that you vary massively from forum to forum. What I will do is what I said I would earlier is try to provide, if it's helpful, uh, something that can give you a bit of a step by step guide about how you might think about it yourselves. Um, so, Carol. Um, if that's helpful, then then we can get that sorted out. Um, just bear with me while I read the next question. Right. Question from Julie. Um, your forms a constituted group and you haven't applied for anything other than a DFE grant. You've been told there are local trusts, but you don't know where to find them and what they fund. So the list I've given you should help with local trusts. One of the ways also of finding local trusts, actually, is if you go onto the Charity Commission website, you can search charity by geography and you would be able to find trusts that fund uh, restricted down sometimes to town. Um, sometimes it will be county. So you have to trawl through the lists a bit. But also the other links that I gave you should help with um, with finding those trusts and when you find them it will tell you what they fund and at the very worst their documents on the charity commission website will tell you what their funding objectives are so that's that's how you would find that out um, question six if we approach local businesses for financial support do you have any do's and don'ts for us um, I do and I'll come on to that Probably actually not in that much detail, but I think um, a lot of what I've covered in, in fact, a lot of, if I just scroll back up, um, this advice here, uh, a lot of that applies to working with companies. I think um, they're, they're often, they have other needs, um, which I will talk about a bit later, but some of the principles that would apply right across the board really um, and it's about relationship it's about being really clear about what it is you're doing what the money's for and about thanking them um, and and being you know I guess as professional as as is possible to be uh, in the resources that you have so okay I think 
Right. Um, we have a question from Julie. If you're a community interest company, are there better options than others in terms of applying for funding? I have to say, Julie, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, what laws are involved if you want to run your own lottery or cash draw prizes? I'm coming on to that. What is ethical funding and should we be doing it? Mm. That's a <laughs> that's a big one, the ethical funding. I think you have to make a, a decision about that yourselves. What I would say on ethical funding is that if you are um, a registered charity, uh, you have to think very carefully about um, what it is that you're you know how easy you would find it to refuse funding the institute of fundraising have some information on developing an ethical policy um, and i'll give you a link to that a bit later okay um question from peter at the moment we're a forum under an umbrella of a charity does this affect us applying to any trusts what i would say peter is if you're using their charitable trust char charity number then yes you'd have to apply as that charity okay so i'm just very conscious of the time i'm not sure quite where that's gone um so oops so community and events this is something that uh, you do it or you get others to do it this should i'm guessing will be familiar to you um so you have events like dinners bake sales sponsored walks quiz nights cheese and wine evenings golf days all that kind of stuff um you can set up those sorts of events uh, or you could get others to do them on your behalf. So it might be you've got um, a group of parents that would be up for running a coffee morning or, you know, a dad who um, whose local pub is is up for doing a bit of a quiz for you where you don't have to organise it. And they do. If you're organising them, you can add value by including raffles or auctions with donated prizes. Bit of advice here is to budget properly for them and have a small team that works on them. Don't leave it to everybody. It's stating the bleeding obvious, I think, but um, you'd be surprised how people end up working themselves into the ground on these. There's always more work than you think they're going to be. And think very carefully about who will take part and how you promote it. There's no point in putting an event on if there's nobody around who's likely to want to come. Um, and make sure you comply with health and safety. I'll say a little bit more about that um, in a minute. So there's a list of things to think about here. So have you got permission and a license if you need one to run the event? You might need an entertainment license, you might need an alcohol license, and you might need a gaming license. Um, have you carried out a risk assessment? Uh, have you got insurance? You probably need public liability insurance. Um, have you made sure that any food complies with regulations? Have you considered the environmental impact of the events you're running and take steps to minimise these? One of the hot topics in this area uh, recently was um, helium balloons, because when you set them off and they come down, uh, they can be very damaging to wildlife. So that might be an example of an environmental impact. Have you got contingency or cancellation plans if something goes wrong? Um, and have you taken steps to think about how accessible the event is? I have a suspicion that if you guys are organising events, that accessibility is probably something that will be front of mind. Um, and it, will the event involve children? And if so, do you know your responsibilities? There's a whole lot around this. Um, I'm going to make sure there is some more information on this stuff um, online when the webinar goes online. Um, and like anything, be clear about, I've said about what you want to achieve, who are your target audience. Do do a budget for an event. As a fundraising director, as a fundraising manager, the number of staff I've had who said, oh, it didn't raise any money, but it was really good PR. Well, it's, you know, that's no help when you've got work that you need to be delivering and you need the funding. Um, be clear about where and when and can you get sponsorship for it and plan well for on the day. So more detailed handout will be available on this um, if you need it. Uh, the other way of getting um, others to do it for you is actually to go to groups like the Rotary Seroptimists. If you don't know what they are, it's groups of professional women and Google them. Um, the Lions, uh, sometimes you can get, uh, get 
connected to the mayor's fund if they have one schools will sometimes do stuff for you particularly if you've got um, a family with a very strong link with the school and sometimes runners um, that you know might do a marathon or um, half marathon for you and getting others to do it for you relationships are the key there it's who you know um, and we're apparently only ever six points removed from anybody so who do you know and who do they know um, develop those relationships and see if you can get other people to do it for you I'm just conscious of the time so I'm not going to stop for questions now I'm just going to rattle through and we'll take questions at the end thank you for hanging on and I know we're getting through a lot here we talked about corporate um, and we had a question about that uh, so there are a number of corporates that support local causes um, where it's relatively easy to apply. So the Co-op Community Fund, um, Waitrose Community Matters and Tesco Bags for Help. All the information you need is online for those. I did, for reasons I won't bore you with, um, a, an application to the Co-op Community Fund myself recently. It was really straightforward. Um, and uh, you can you can get a few thousand pounds from that and you do have to give them a project but they they don't they're they, you know, they're quite flexible in what that is and how that's described um they're definitely ones that are worth looking at and also you can think about getting in kind support so you might get a venue or even get somebody to speak at a training event if you've got a local firm of tame solicitors who do work in um in the kind of areas that you might be interested in they might put on something for you uh, they're always looking for a bit of local publicity um, companies businesses local businesses might provide donations for prizes for goodie bags or refreshments and as i said sometimes they'll provide speakers sponsorship for events is also a possibility particularly somebody you might need a bit of local pr they might fund the cost of your printing or, or something like that now with with corporates you, you still need to approach them um, with a case of support, be really clear about what their money's going to do and what you will do in return. And often that's about giving them some publicity. So that could be their information in a programme or on a flyer, on a poster, could be that you get in touch with the local press. And you can always do that, um, you know, get them to the event, have some photos and use those photos in the local paper. Um, they won't expect a huge amount, but uh, yeah, whoever gives you money will want something in return um, but ask them what it is they need and, and what it is they would like uh, and they will tell you um, so and then finally um, well not finally almost finally keeping it legal <sighs> this could be a whole day's training on its own the Institute of Fundraising has a huge amount of resource available around what you have to comply with, how to run your event, the things you need to think about. Um, it's really easy to access. So have a look at their, um, their guidance. Um, there's also the fundraising regulator has codes of practice for different areas of fundraising. Uh, worth a look at those. Do remember restricted means restricted. So if you've said you'll spend it on something, then you need to spend it on that. If you can't, then you tell the funder and see what they say. And you also have to comply with the general data protection legislation. The Institute of Fundraising have a code of fundraising practice relating to this. Um, but you do need to think about it because if generally, if you're going to communicate with people about fundraising, they have to have opted into it. Um, and I feel like I've just lobbed a little bit of a grenade in there because there's just so much about this uh, that that um, you need to to pay a little bit of attention to. The Information Commissioner's Office is a good source of um, information about this. Um, so a couple of examples of forums that have done stuff. Um, Family Voice Peterborough, uh, they have events, Asian Cuisine Day, they've done raffles, fates and tombolas. They've sold governance and training packs um, and they do work to share resources with other organisations. Uh, funders always like it if you're working in partnership um, and they are looking for volunteer support for events through uh, businesses who have corporate social responsibility um, 
who have who do stuff under corporate social responsibility and i had a look at their website and it appears they're having an easter fair on the 13th of april so it gives you a bit of a flavor of the kind of stuff they're getting into um and uh i mentioned pods before at telford and reekin they've got a lottery um there's the link there you can have a look at, at what they're doing so a couple of nice examples and then reading families forum have got a bit of information from uh, uh information sorry reading families forum have got some funding from cdc uh for uh, to create a young person's participation forum so this is as it's not your trust and foundations um a bit more statutory i guess uh, and it was also used to fund someone to go into schools and make contact with parent carers there to increase their confidence and get their views. So, uh, you know, another nice example of what's possible. Other useful links, Institute of Fundraising, I've mentioned Charity Commission, Directory of Social Change and NCVO, just Google them. You will find local sector bodies. There's a really, really good one, um, uh, Vaughan in the Northeast, uh, that uh, if you're up that way, you probably already know about them, but they provide really good resources. Organisations like Liverpool CVS, there will be stuff local to you. Um, I don't know where you are, uh, but, but you know, they shouldn't be difficult to track down. And then um, we've got a couple of books, the Voluntary Sector Legal Handbook and the Complete Fundraising Handbook that you might find helpful. OK, so. Final questions. Um, I have a question from. Um, Julie, uh, what about not raising funds but getting companies to send a group of staff to your forum to do a piece of work or help with an event? Absolutely, really good idea. And that's what um, Peterborough um, had in their example. I think um, we at Contact actually, we've got a couple of corporates who support us and they might help out at family days. Uh, you know, they might do things like if you've got a family who um, need their garden doing um they might do something like that probably not directly what you're about but it can be a good way of establishing a relationship um if you're running an event like a sponsored walk or a a, a, you know, a fair or something they might send volunteers along to help on the day because often we're short of either short of manpower or short of the manpower we have is short of time so julie yeah absolutely that's a, a really really good idea so we are drawing to an end. Um, I don't see a rush of questions coming through. I realise that there will be a lot of things you might be sitting there thinking, oh, she hasn't mentioned this and she hasn't mentioned that. Um, and I'm sorry if there's something I have missed. Um, doing this in an hour is, uh, is, is, is tight, really, because each of the subjects we could have had well half a day on so i hope it's given you a flavor um and given you some pointers in the right direction and obviously um you will be asked to uh, to do your short questionnaire um please do fill that in i actually don't know what that looks like um but if there's anything in addition to what we've covered today or anything that you'd like to see more in depth and you get the opportunity here on your questionnaire to to put that in then you know we're very happy to look at whether we can do something about that um but thank you very much for your time um it would have been lovely to meet you uh, but um i guess this is how radio presenters feel and and good luck with your fundraising thank you